اعوذ باللہ من شر الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم رب شرح لی صدری ویسر لی امری وحلل عقدتا من لسانی یفقہ قولی بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمدللہ رب العالمین وصل اللہ علی سیدنا وحبیب قلوبنا وشفیع نفوسنا ابا القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء أما بعد respected scholars, elders, brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته To insha'Allah in light of recent events in light of the events that have been happening for the last 1400 years in reference to the attack, in reference to the oppression and in reference to the dhulam of anyone that is encompassed as a muwali, as a muhib or as a shia of Ali ibn Abi Talib I'd like to dedicate tonight's topic inshallah to analyze why is it that we are being attacked? Why is it that the school of Ahl al-Bayt is under threat? Why is it that throughout history we have been subject to being attacked and who is doing the attacking? Now inshallah I want to analyze it in three particular points. The first point is to look at one specific group of people that may encompass the majority. The second is to look at the, the belief system that they have. As in why is it that they believe that we should be attacked? Why is it that they believe that they will attain heaven if they kill a particular number of the Mu'aleen of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. And in the concluding note, inshallah, we'd like to look at how is it that we should go about representing ourselves? How is it that we should go about defending ourselves? And what action is needed from us in order to defend that which we solidly stand on. Inshallah, we start the topic, inshallah, for tonight. But before it, we'd like to raise the first of your loudest salawat in honor of the greatest man that walked this earth, Al Habibul Mustafa Muhammad. The second in honor of the greatest lady to walk this earth, Al Hawra'ul Batuli Fatima. And the third and your final salawat, and inshallah to start off, tonight's topic is in the honor of Imam Sahib al-Asri wa-Zaman. For tonight's topic, inshallah, the specific people that I want to direct my attention to and direct tonight's topic to is a group of people that were likely to call themselves or were labeled as being the Khawarij. These people, as you know, were derived after Ali ibn Abi Talib came into Khilafat. When he had his first war, as in Jamal, that finished, you find Safin happened, and a particular incident known as the arbitration happened, and that's what led to the production of the Khawarij. Now let's look at the Khawarij. And this is very important to a topic to look at in the idea of the image of these people, how they portrayed themselves and what they think that they represent. Very, very important, brothers and sisters. Number one, the khawarij, as the wording of our imams represent them, says these are the people, very close attention, these are the people that used to pray Salatul Subh, the morning prayers, with the wudu of the previous Farida, which means Maghrib and Isha, they prayed, they finished Isha, the whole night they're in worship, they did not need to repeat their wudu and they would pray Salat al-Subh. Now I want you to analyze that you might think to yourself in the first encounter that wow, these people are in ibadah. These people have been up the whole night. These people have been reading Quran. The Prophet sallallahu he says, people will come in which when they recite the Holy Quran, the Quran does not 
go beyond their tongues. It does, they did not comprehend the particular Quran. They don't understand how to put it into practice. This khawarij, now listen, because people would look at them and say to themselves, wow, these are of the most religious figures because they were beaded. They, you find them that they used to be up all night in prayers. They used to be up all night in reciting the Holy Quran. However, we look at that one side and we look at the other side in which they fought Ali ibn Abi Talib. If we have him, the Prophet of Islam, the Quran, the entire Quran, we look at it. Ali, 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 Ali. And you find these people representing Islam, however, fighting Ali ibn Abi Talib. Now, this is where the first fitna came into practice. This is when people started to question themselves. These people appear to be of an Islamic nature. However, we know so many narrations, and we know that Ali ibn Abi Talib is the Quran that is Nataq. And the Quran is Nataq. Ali ibn Abi says about himself, he says, look at it. So we have the balance. This is the first entity, and we can question it nowadays. When we have this balance, how is it that we can differentiate? Well, clearly the Quran, we can find that Ibn Talib is in so many verses. Then we find Ali ibn Abi Talib, the Prophet has a statement about him. He says, Ali ma'al haq, wal haq ma'a Ali yaduru ma'ahu haythu ma da. That means, look at the instance, look at the specific nature of this hadith. Ali is with the truth. That's one and says, okay, not a problem. Ali is always on the right path. Then the Prophet goes on to say, no, the truth is also with Ali. It rotates or it revolves around him wherever he so goes. Let's look at this. Then we have the Khawarij. These are the people that came to Ali ibn Abi Talib, threatened Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says, what? They say the leadership is for Allah, not for you. As if to say that they can take the jurisprudential arguments by themselves. Number one, let's... Look at these characteristics in the second level. Why is it that these people are who they are? Why do they do what they do? Because they have complete faith that this is the right path. This is what we're doing is the right and the correct manner. If we look at them and their characteristics, and I tell you on a personal perspective, because I, as a young, when I used to go into primary school, the only Muslim school in the area was not that of a Shia background. I went to this school at the first years, year kindergarten, year one, year two, and year three, and then you begin to realize, okay, this is Islamic, you know, there's sisters on one side, brothers on the other. Let's look at what they taught, to analyze what kind of people and how they learn. The number one rule that we had was never question anything. Never question anything. Whatever the elder says, whatever the religious figure says, do not question it. As in, you have to pray in this manner. You have to do wudu in these, or they gave us three different ways to make wudu. He says, any one of these, you make wudu, it's right. And you, start, you want to question, like, why is it we have three wudu? You know, you, you're, as, a, as a young child, you question many things. The Shia school of thought say, no, make sure you question. That foundation that you're on, make sure that it's solid. Make sure you know exactly what path you're on. Make sure you know who Ali ibn Abi Talib is. Make sure you know who the Ahl al-Bayt are. Make sure your foundation is solid. Look how shaky that foundation is. Anything that you have, a question in your mind, you're not allowed to ask. Sir, this, I can't understand this. Can you exp No. This is how it's done. Full stop. That's number one. Number two, they had this idea that do not talk to Shia. And we find it nowadays. Do not talk to the followers of Ahlul Bayt. I'll give you an example. Nowadays in ISIS, we had a reliable source that had one of the people that were defending Iraq... They captured one of these people known as ISIS. They took him to the jails. Now let's look at what they say in the jails. Most of them don't talk. He says one of them spoke out once. He asked him, he says, why is it that you do not speak to us? Like we've taken care of you, we've captured you, however we feed you, we've clothed you. Why do you not speak to us? Look at the reply. He says, we've been taught that if we speak to a Shia, or a follower of Ahl al-Bayt, we have to fast for three days. Why? What's the argument? Can we understand further? Because no, that's all we've been told. If we talk to a Shia, we have to fast for three days. And you think to yourself, no wonder they think the worst of us. What have they been shown? What have they been given? Number one, in this instance. Number two, you begin to ask them why. Someone may come forth and state, and many of them have. They say that... If we talk to a Shia, they will 
magically rotate your head towards Ahl al-Bayt. They're magicians. They can do, use their magic against you. Let's look at the olden days. What did the Prophet, when he came to with the message, what did they call him? The Prophet of Islam says, this is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are my miracles. This is logic. What did they call the Prophet of Islam? Sahir. They called him a magician. Nowadays, anyone that has logic is known as a magician. It's to say a lot about what kind of brain capacities they have if they magically make them think about logic. But that's another instance. On the third level, so the first level we find that they do not speak. The second do not question. The third level they've been brainwashed into many aspects of how we may be on the wrong path. You come and have an argument with them and they think to themselves, no, I don't have anything to defend it. So they break the argument, you're a Shia, you're not out of Islam, I'm going the other way. Straight away the other path. And that's why we have people nowadays, the Khawarij back then, you find the Khawarij back then attacked through one leader to another. If we had any particular person throughout history, you find the Shias were oppressed. The Shias were not allowed to go towards the shrines of Ahlul Bayt. They were not allowed to go towards the ziyara of Abu Abdullah. Every single era, it was a different ruler. Every single era, there was a different way, a different mannerism that they thought they would stop the ziyara of Imam Hussein. And this, this flag of Imam Hussein represents so much if we have to analyze it into depth. Imam Hussein, you imagine this is going through a whole scenario. The Khawarij came into power. Then they began to attack, attack, attack. Then people were misguided. Otherwise, why would you have one side of an army, Muslims, in the 10th of Muharram? They prayed Salatul Jama'ah. Imam Hussein, 72 companions with him. He also prayed Jama'ah. Where is the confusion? Why is it that people on one side, they say Allahu Akbar. They say Muhammadun Rasulullah. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Then they go on and kill his grandson. What kind of... They believe that the Prophet of Islam is the messenger of God. And they kill him because he's the embodiment. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Husaynun minni wa ana min. Therefore, who did they kill on the 10th of Muharram? Giving you an idea of who these people were that attacked Islam. And year upon year, we find it within ourselves that they try to stop and they try to stop and they try to stop. However much one person dies in this path, you find 10 others emerge. 10 die, a thousand emerge. It's what strengthens us. The Shahada is within us. It's something that we look forward to. It's something that that it's a fire in every single woman's heart to die on this particular path. One of the greatest companions of Ali ibn Abi Talib was captured, him and his son. And they said to him, they said, what's your last wish? What do you want as a last thing in your life? What do you want? He says, I want you to kill my son first. You think there's other things you may think of, there's other attributes that you may think that they, he wants, for example, a den or something to eat or something to do. He says, kill my son. As we know in analogies, the best and the most proud moment of a father is to have his son, his newborn in his hand. And the hardest thing for a father is to bury a son before him. That's why Imam al Hussein, when you look at the analogies that we have from the 10th of Muharram, Sakina narrates, he says, I found that my father was knee death when he was laying on the plains of Karbala alongside Ali ibn al-Akbar. He was knee death. This man, the companion of Ali ibn Talib, says, I want you to kill my son before you kill me. He says, not a problem, we can do that. So they kill the son in front of him. The father is in pain. But he thanks Allah. They say, why is it that you've killed your son? He says, I also want to pray two rak'at. He says, okay, we'll ask you after. He prays two rak'at. And the person, the executor is waiting there, sharpening his blade. He says, after he finishes salat, imagine, these are the companions of Ali ibn Abi Talib. These are the people that we admire to be like. He finishes his two rak'at. The person that's waiting to execute him, he says, look, you're the companion of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says, yes. 
He says, why is it that you took that long in prayers? You want to breathe more of this air from this dunya before I execute you? He says, Yashhadullah. He says, may Allah bear witness that this was the fastest prayer I have ever prayed. That's the companions of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Then they ask him, why is it that your son, you wanted him to die before you? He says, so I can die a happy man knowing that my son died on the wilaya of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. He says, just in case he fears death, he sees the blade near him and then he goes back the other way. He says, I want him to die on this path. He does not know the rewards that await him. Does not know the rewards that await him. Now, how can we defend ourselves as such people? Ali ibn Talib has a statement. He says, if I have never come across or debated with a man of knowledge, except that I have defeated him. However, I have never debated a stubborn man. You know, one of those people that do not want to listen to anything you say. Whatever you throw at them, no. You're wrong, full stop. He says, I've never debated these kind of people except loss. Because they do not want to take the information. The whole idea of dialect in essence in the Latin language is to look through the other person's view. That's the idea of dialogue. If we have people that don't want to look at your particular position, don't want to even consider it, why is it that we even have dialogue with such people? That's why we have to stay away. And these people, they don't have any pleasant ideas in their heads. They just want to attack and attack and attack because that's what they believe is correct. That path that they're on, they believe it with all their inner selves and emotions. So therefore, what can we do as representatives of the school of Ahlul Bayt? What can we do in honor so that we may die on this particular path to uphold this particular position that we're in? Imam Ali Ayyub said one position, he says what? He says, make sure you don't debate. Do not consider dialogue unless you know that particular person will take what you give them. If this person is stubborn, don't even think about it. If he's an extremist, don't even think about it. Do not put yourself in a vulnerable position like that. And on the second level, make sure that if they are the extremes, they're Muslim, they're in the spotlight, they're in the media, and that's the negative inculcation of the whole idea of this concept. That they're always in the spotlight. They give what we know as the image of Islam. Whenever you open the TV, they're on the front channel. They're on the live channel. That's what, this is the Islamic state, etc. And that's, that's a calamity. That's not Islam. Islam means peace. Islam means that everyone shall not be harmed. Ali ibn Abi Talib says it in his covenant to Malik al-Ashtar. He says, make sure people are of two types, either your brother in faith or your equal in humanity. Covenant of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Your equal in humanity. And these people come forth and know they kill every single Tom, Dick and Harry in front of them. If they don't join their cause. Where's, where's the religiosity? Where's Islam? The Prophet of Islam, go look at the, the guidelines in which he wrote in Medina. Go look at the guidelines. Even the Christians and the Jews were protected within his guidelines. But we don't look at that. These people don't look at that. They're just given orders. Do not question them. They do as they're told. Like sheep. Just do as they're told. Now, for the shuhada, for the people that die on this path, let's look at the people that die on this path. Because before us, we find Ali ibn Abi Talib. Himself was killed by who? Ibn Muljim, which was a from the per people which were known as the Khawarij. Killed Ali ibn Talib. Ali ibn Talib when Ibn Muljim was, and this is the irony of it, when he was an orphan, a beggar, Ali ibn Talib used to give him the food. He goes, he grows, he gets strength, he goes and kills Ali ibn Talib. That's the irony of it. And Ali ibn Talib, look at the justice of Ali ibn Talib. It says, don't harm him. He says, if I die, then it's a hit for a hit, an eye for an eye. He says, he struck me once, you struck him once, if I die. Ali ibn Abi Talib. The people that die in this path, the people that are rewarded with the blessing of the 
being a shaheed in this life. I want to give you a story narrated by a person by the name of Sheikh Ja'far al-Ibrahimi. And he says this because it's one of his closest companions, his closest friends, and otherwise I wouldn't say it on the pulpit. He says one of our people back home, he says in Karbala, he says a bomb went off. Pay close attention to what, what's happened, to analyze what kind of state we're in, and analyze that we are in the eyes of the Prophet, that we are in the eyes and in the glance of Fatima al-Zahra. We are in the glance and in the eyesight of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Oh. He says, there once was a bomb in Karbala. He says, after that bomb happened, a person narrating it, he says, I wasn't harmed that much. I had a few grazes, but they still took me towards the hospital. He says, oh, there were people that died. There were people that were in a coma, people that have fainted. He says, I went to the hospital with a person next to me, one patient next to me. He was in a coma. Let's look at this detail, brothers and sisters. He says, he was in a coma. He says, a few hours he awoke from the coma. Now, he doesn't know anything that's happened. He was in a coma since the blast. He says, he was with him the whole time. He awakes from a coma. The first thing he does, what does he do? He slaps his face. Viciously, he begins slapping his face. The person's coming to him, he's calming him down. He says, you know, he was a Sayyid at the time. He says, Sayyid, don't worry. It's only minor injuries. You're fine. There's nothing wrong. Your, your sons, they're safe. It's absolutely fine. The Sayyid looks at him. He says, what fine? How is it fine? You don't know what's happened. He says, what's happened, Sayyid? He says, such and such person, he died, Yes. He says, yes. He says, such and such person, he died as well. He says, yes. How do you know this? He says, what are you saying? He says, as soon as the blast went off, Imam Hussein was there. He says, Imam Hussein was there as soon as the blast went off. He says, he came to each and every individual. He says, do you want to come with me? Such and such says, yes, I'll come. He went. He says, such and such that I said that he's died. He went with Imam Hussein. He says, and what's the problem? He says, he came and asked me if I want to go with him. He says, what did you say? He says, no, I just married my two sons. I have to take care of them. He says, I, don't, I can't come with you today. And that's why I've awakened now and I'm slapping myself. That's the end means, brothers and sisters. Look at what position we're in. We're in the eyes of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. I end on this, brothers and sisters, because I'm out of time for tonight. But inshallah, we will continue this particular idea and topic and to analyze how we can be the best in the image or portraying the image of Islam. Because Imam Sadiq says this time and time again, make sure how you act, how you portray yourself, how you carry yourself, that in itself, you are a messenger for Islam. When people look at you, they want to be drawn towards you. They have to be drawn towards you by your actions, by your morals, by your smile, by your transactions. When they know this is a Shia of the Ahlul Bayt, when they know this is a particular person that's a Muwali of Ahlul Bayt, they know that this person doesn't cheat, doesn't lie, has the best morals, the best ethics. And that's what we have to be known for. And I end on this, brothers and sisters. We pray to Allah that Allah keeps us firm in this particular madhab to keep us firm in the wilaya of Ali ibn Abi Talib and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to elevate us in such a manner that the Imam Sahib al-Asri was zaman can look at us and bless us with his presence and allow us to be of his army. With, and I end on this inshallah, Surah Al-Mubarakat Al-Fatiha, but before it three of your loudest salawat ala Muhammad وآل محمد